Hello fellow plot questers, it's been a while since I'm back at the familiar bookshelf to do a review of Sophocles' Oedipus the King. So obviously this is a three Theban plays. The one that I read and I'm going to talk about today is Oedipus the King and it deserves a review of its own so that's what we're going with. So Oedipus the King or otherwise known as Oedipus Rex is this play. And first, I'll start with a plot summary, talk about the themes, talk about my analysis and takes, and rate it out of 10. So, let's get started. First of all, the plot summary. So, have you guys ever heard of the Oedipus Complex? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. It's a Freudian concept that basically states a man or, or a child, the first hate of a child is his dad, and the first love of his child is the mother. And that term, the Oedipus Complex, loving your mother and hating your father, comes from this story. You see, Oedipus is a king, or he is of royal blood. He was born under the king and queen of Thebes. However, he was born with a terrible fate. He is meant to kill his own father and wed with his own mother. And obviously, the mom and dad are like, hell the heck no, and tosses him. And, and tries to get one of their slaves to kill him. But the slaves fail to kill him and he lives and he gets adopted by another king and queen in a, in a different place. And now we have a situation that's, where, and that's kind of where Oedipus the king starts. Where he is now king at Thebes and he is married to his mother already. And he has accidentally killed his father in a blind road rage like a couple years ago. So that's kind of where the story starts off. So... Here we have Oedipus the king, who is supposed to be this amazing king, right? He saved the city of Thebes all those years ago from the deadly Sphinx, you know. He replaced him as king and married with the old queen, Jocasta, who, you know, we know is his mother, which is disgusting. And we have the situation where a plague hits Thebes, and everyone's dying, and everyone's sick, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, we need help, like, we're all gonna die, my king, so what are we gonna do about it? And basically, Oedipus is like, okay, guys, I'll solve this problem because I'm an amazing king. So he already has sent one of his, uh, a person to go to the Oracle of Delphi to get help to solve this issue. And basically, the person comes back, and the Oracle said, and what the Oracle said was, you gotta find the person who killed Laius, who is the previous king, uh, spoiler alert, Oedipus' father, and also the guy that Oedipus killed, according to his fate. And the oracle basically says, the murderer of the previous king is still resides in Thebes, so until you cast them out, this plague will continue. So Oedipus is like, damn this murderer! I'm gonna find them, not just for our fellow kinsmen, but because, you know, they might be, they might try to kill me! Oh, the bitter irony, because the person who killed Laius is him. So the rest of the play goes on with him investigating and trying to find out who it is. He consults another oracle, the blind oracle Tiresias, and basically flies to a blind rage when Tiresias finally, after he, you know, gaslighted and interrogated him for like a full 10 minutes, when Tiresias finally goes, it's you, Oedipus, you're the guy who murdered your father slash, you know, the previous king. And Oedipus just flies into a blind rage and says, all of you are conspiring against me to take my throne. Yeah, he's a little bit delusional. And basically, that kind of goes on until he eventually finds out that indeed, the terrible fate has come true. You know, he has killed his own father and at, the, at where the roads meet uh, all those decades ago when he freed Thebes from the Sphinx right before that. He killed a bunch of random people, a royal procession, and that one of those people happened to be the previous king of Thebes, who also happens to be his father. And he wed with Jocasta, who is his mother. So his wife slash mother, finding out about this, goes, I can't take this anymore, and hangs herself. And Oedipus, realizing that he'd been so blind, so arrogant, that he thought he knew better than everybody else, takes Jocasta, her, his wife slash mother of like five children, I think it's five children, something like that, uh, hairpins of wife slash mother, and stabs it in his, ma in his eyes. And uh, he, he, he's blind now. And he goes to exile, and that—that's the end of the play. Kind of a, 
I actually really love this play. I think it's hilarious. But yeah, that's kind of the dark ending of the play. So that's kind of the plot. Okay, let's talk about the themes. I think the main theme, I guess, and motif that we're kind of dealing with is hubris and God-given fate. With Oedipus, who's this awesome king, he likes to talk about himself, he likes to show off, he likes to think that he is as great as the gods, and we, have, we also have this situation where essentially his God-given fate is to kill his, kill his father and marry his mother, and he's trying to avoid that, and he thought he already evaded that fate, but... He hasn't, and he, it's all in the hands of the gods, right? And he's being too arrogant for that. And we have this motive of sight, right? Because he thinks he's the best, he thinks he's the greatest king of ever, like Oedipus, but actually he's completely blind. He's blind to the fact that he has indeed committed these heinous acts, that he's the murderer that he is looking for. And the fact that Tiresias, the blind prophet, is the only one who knows the truth and has any kind of common sense other than Creon, uh, his brother-in-law slash uncle. Oh man, that's disgusting. I don't want to think about that. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's telling, right? The blind one is the one who actually sees and the one with fine eyes cannot see. And when he does find out about the truth, he tears out his eyes so he no longer can see. Again, the motive of sight is there. Now, my main analysis of this text, and what I really appreciate about this text, is definitely Oedipus's characterization. To be exact, through the various ways he's characterized, kind of makes him seem like a hero, like this awesome hero who's, you know, freed the thieves and defeated the Sphinx through his incredible intelligence and wit. Um, but it's underhandedly, char indirectly, characterizing him as kind of a douchebag. And what I mean by this is uh, there's two main ways of characterizing, right? The first way is indirect characterization, and th this is really prominent in the chorus, in the citizens of Thebes going, you know, Oedipus, you are the great one, you know, you are second you're first of men, and, you know, you're not a god, but you're first of men, and we pray to you, you know, have mercy on your children, you know, you saved us all in those days, and all that, and you're a great king. And, obviously, the chorus kind of glazing Oedipus with all these positive things about him, that's, that's meant to be a thing that establishes Oedipus as a positive character, right? It's like, you know, I come up to you and say, hey, this guy's a really great person, he saved us all, like, obviously, that's a positive thing. But the fact that the crowd and the chorus is all focusing on these huge, like, these details of his grandeur and all this, like, all the good stuff that he did, and especially since they put emphasis on how, you know, he needed no help. You know, you did, you, we didn't teach you anything, but you did it, and you're great, and you're the best. It, it makes it seem like that Oedipus actually really enjoys that, this kind of flattery and glazing um, to kind of an unhealthy amount. Um, the fact that the crowd knows that they have to glaze him, essentially, and, and mash him with compliments to get him to do anything, I feel like it's showing that he's kind of arrogant, and he's kind of a little bit narcissistic and a little bit self-absorbed, and, and that's not a good thing, right? So we got this indirect characterization, and then there's this amazing direct characterization of, you know, I think I did mention this previously, of immediately falling into a blind rage when things don't go his way. It takes him like 30 seconds to to go and say like, oh, you're all conspiring to take over the throne and kill me. Um, when he's talking to a prophet of Apollo, right? I mean, that's crazy. According to ancient Athenian standards, that's nuts. So we, we have this direct characterization of him Every time things don't go no, he just, he, it's like a tamper tantrum from a baby, right? Like, oh, mommy said I can't eat this ice cream, and then you cry and whine about it. And that's the kind of characterization that we're getting of Oedipus through his emotional reactions to these slight inconveniences or these new pieces of information. So, in other words, I feel like this entire story is crafted in a way where, well, obviously, this play is actually an adaptation of the original mythology of Oedipus, which was likely orally introduced and known by most of the Athenians, like a fairy tale, like we know Snow White, or, or something else, right? Um, likely acted as a warning for the ancient Athenians to net not get too full of themselves, especially considering that the gods exist, 
and there's no one greater than the gods. So I, even you, you may be great for a human, but you can never overcome the gods. And I feel like that is the strong message. And obviously, you know, obviously we aren't in ancient Athens. We are, we live in a society that's, you know, not necessarily religious, some of us. But even so, that message about not getting too full of yourself, not becoming, not being blinded by hubris, I feel like that is an amazing moral that you can learn from this really well-written and interesting story. And it makes sense, because considering Athens back then, at this time when Sophocles kind of adapted and wrote this play, well, it was at the peak of the world, right? In terms of thought, it had the greatest minds of possibly, arguably, even history at this point. And they were militarily the greatest in the Mediterranean. Like, they had everything. Athens was the center of the world in many, many ways. So, the fact that this story talks about hubris and the danger of it, I feel like is a huge indicator of that societal kind of reflection at that time. And that's kind of all the interesting things that I think about this. How do I rate it? 9 out of 10. Really, really good. I liked it a lot. It's short and sweet. It has a lot of dramatic moments and everything kind of makes sense, I guess. It like flows well together because I think it's really hard to have a play that's this short and kind of makes sense throughout, right? Because well, sometimes a short play kind of just feels like a jump cut, a jump cut, and jump cut. Like, he killed him! <gasps> we found fingerprints on the knife and the fingerprints is his mother! You know, like, it's a little too fast sometimes. But I feel like it handles that whiplash pacing really well while still being really effective with its foreshadowing, its dramatic irony, its characterization, and the various techniques it uses to talk, to handle these interesting themes and this interesting story. So that's about it, everyone. And like always, your plot quester and the plot quester. Awesome book, guys. Would highly recommend. I loved it.